MZTV. Oh, yep, God is a tough one. That's true, but he's the only deity we have. So we have to learn of him, we have to see his ways, and we have to know as we contemplate these consequential things, as we see people dying upon the earth, as we consider the coming indignation, we have to keep it in mind all the time. And this is going to seem crazy when I'm about to say that God is love and everything he does is for the purpose of contrast to ensure the eternal happiness of his creatures and that's a fact welcome to mctv i'm martin zender your host yeah i'm going to read a passage from luke 11 49 52. i'm going to show you what god did with that generation and then i'm going to show you what he does with the generation that is alive at the time of babylon and in fact uh, the individuals that are involved with the evil city that, as I told you yesterday, has come to represent every heinous thing that humanity has ever done. Let me put it to you this way. Uh, in the next seven years or so, if anybody ever invites you to move to Babylon, politely decline. Oh, here's one of my bookmarks sent to me by Rhonda Buick. There she is, beautiful lady, supporter of the work, and uh, sent me a bookmark. Yeah, if you want to send me a photo of yourself, I will use it as a bookmark. It's really an honor. It sounds terrible. Martin's using me as a bookmark. No, it's a great thing. It's a great thing. Okay, Luke 11, starting with verse 49. Consequently, you are witnesses and are endorsing the acts of your fathers. This is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. Woe to you, for you are building the tombs of the prophets, yet your fathers killed them. What an irony that is. Consequently, you are witnesses and are endorsing the acts of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, yet you are building their tombs. Therefore, also God's wisdom said, this is God's wisdom, quote, I shall be dispatching to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will be killing and banishing, that the blood of all the prophets, which is shed from the disruption of the world, may be exacted from this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the house. Sounds like a bad way to go. How did your husband die? Well, he perished between the altar and the house. I don't know exactly how that works. But apparently it's fatal. Yes, I'm saying to you it will be exacted from this generation. Jesus repeats it. So it's very serious. Woe to you who are learned in the law. And on he goes. From the blood of Abel. It's not that the individuals who did these things won't be held accountable at the great white throne. They will be. But I guess it sucks to live in the generation from which God exacts all the blood of every righteous person from the disruption of the world to that time. But that is exactly what God did to the generation in Jerusalem alive when Jesus walked the earth. Kind of a bad zip code to have during that time. Now let's go to Revelation 17. Verses 1 through 6. And one from among the seven messengers who have the seven bowls came, and he speaks with me, saying, Hither I shall be showing you the sentence of the great prostitute who is sitting on many waters, with whom, this is Babylon, with whom the kings of the earth commit prostitution, and those dwelling on the earth are made drunk with the wine of her prostitution. It may take me another show to get into the details of this wine of her prostitution what is it what has intoxicated the nations that has come from babylon you see babylon is not yet maybe it is it's not yet the underground stronghold the bunker that i told you about yesterday un unless it is but babylon as a type as a figure represents that which corrupts the inhabitants of the earth corrupting them through pleasures and through greed pleasures and greed greed and pleasures avarice and hedonism if you like the bigger words 
and it has to do with the Israel types. I'm sorry to have to say this, but it's true. The Israel types, strangely enough, own all the companies that provide entertainment and basically anything you want. Anything you want, they have. And they, if you go up the ladder high enough, you'll find an Israel type. It's just the way it is. I can give you a quote from Joel Stein from Time Magazine. I don't have the quote here, but I can paraphrase it. Joel Stein, an Israel type, wrote in Time Magazine, I forget when, uh, but he said, you know, I'm sick and tired of everybody telling me that the Israel types own most of the entertainment industry, most of the print industry, most of the music industry, most of the movie industry. I'm tired of that. We don't own most of it. We own all of it. Quote, that's Joel Stein, a writer for Time magazine. Anyway, and he carries me away in spirit. This is verse 3 of the unveiling 17 into a wilderness. And I perceived a woman sitting on a scarlet wild beast. Mind you, this is what John sees. It doesn't appear this way on the earth because that would be kind of freaky. A woman sitting on a scarlet wild beast replete with the names of blasphemy and having seven heads and ten horns. I think John needed a tranquilizer when he got back from this little trip because John sees these things. And the woman was clothed with purple and scarlet and gilded with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, brimming with abominations and the uncleannesses of the prostitution of her and the earth. And this is not just the earth of that day, but it is any earth at any time upon which humanity has dwelt and been corrupted. And even before the Israel types came into being, it's so bad what they have done that everything that happened before them, just like I read in Luke chapter 11, is going to be exacted upon the nation that happens to be, you know, holding the hot potato or, or whatever when the when the buzzer rings, when the when the final bell sounds, whoever's left holding the hot potato, oops, gonna have to exact everything that's ever happened bad upon the earth upon you. Why me? Suck it up. You won't be able to do anything else. And on her forehead is written the name Secret Babylon, the great the mother of the prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. The mother of the prostitutes. All prostitutes. And I perceive the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. This is the beast of Revelation, which is an amalgamation of all religion and political power. It is the confluence of church and state. The worst, the worst church and the worst state that humanity has to offer. It's an illicit union. Thus, the figure of a prostitute sitting on a wild beast. The wild beast is the systems of the earth. The prostitute is unfaithful Israel. Drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. This is what I told you. Those people who say that, ah, oh, this Revelation book... Uh, claiming that Babylon will exist again and that the... the the traumas and the pleasures and the hideousnesses of days past will be exacted upon her. No, no, no. Babylon was destroyed years ago, as I told you. Seleucia, Nic Nicotter, whatever his name is, and the other guy, Trajan. They destroyed Babylon in the first century B.C. Well, no, because this Babylon is drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus who is an A.D. guy. Now, and I marvel at perceiving her the marvelous great. All right, let's let that rest there. And I'm going to go to Revelation 18, 24. This is Biggie. Here we go. And in it, speaking of Babylon, in it the blood of prophets and of saints was found. And of all of those slain upon the earth. So not just those of the prophets that were slain or, or the good people of God that were slain from the disruption of the world to the time of Christ. And not just to those witnesses of Jesus that were 
slayed subsequent to the time of Christ, but all those slain upon the earth. This is a concentration. See, God, again, sent, God sent his Christ to save everyone, and it worked. But we'll see that manifest in eons to come. But in the meantime, for those of you who want to see vengeance and judgment, after all, Paul says, to those of you frustrated by not being able to get back at all the evil people of all time, God says through Paul, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Paul's quoting the Hebrew scriptures there. But God does it for their own good. God is quick in judgment, lingering in blessing. When I say quick in judgment, you might say, well, three and a half years, and that's all this is going to be, all this is going to be. But compared to a thousand years, it's a good investment, as long as I don't have to be there. Yeah, and then at the blood of the prophets and of saints was found, and of all those slain upon the earth. I told you yesterday that I was going to show you strange ways in which some scriptures have been fulfilled, because what I told you yesterday, you might be astounded, you may have been astounded to hear an underground bunker. Babylon is not going to be built above ground, you think? Martin Zender, but it's going to be maybe uh, a labyrinth of underground tunnels and rooms and even cathedrals. I'm saying, yes, it could be. And you think that, well, I'm reading everything it says about Babylon in chapters 17 and 18 about the merchants of the earth mourning her, mourning that no one's buying their cargo. I can't wait to tell you about the word cargo. I was going to do it today, but it looks like I'm going to have to do it Monday. Let me just give you an overview before I go to these verses. I'll give you an overview of what I'm going to do on Monday that I thought I was going to do today. What a surprise I'm not. When the merchants, a merchant is someone who sells something, what makes the world go round? Advertising and sales. People buying shit. That's what makes the world go round. People buying shit. It makes the world go round. And when all of the international, th th this is what this is in chapter 18. It's international commerce. What else is there besides international commerce as far as people getting rich? But the people who will mourn, the people who are the chief salesmen of these things will not be simply mourning the Babylon that is standing, or should I say underground, in that day. They're mourning, and believe me, when that's destroyed, the smoke is going to ascend as the scriptures say. They're mourning the city itself. They're mourning not necessarily the city that is present at that time, the city that is being destroyed before their eyes, but they're mourning Babylon, period. They're mourning everything that Babylon was in the past, its glory, its grandeur, its excessiveness, its pomp, its ceremony. They're mourning the whole thing because Babylon while being a literal place, is also symbolic. And so, apparently, the chiefs of the eon who will be centered in Babylon at the time of the end, which is near, they will be mourning the whole system. They will be mourning what Babylon stood for and has stood for in its, in his, in its entire history, including being, as I said yesterday, the world capital of three different world kingdoms, and it will be the capital of the fourth kingdom. So they're mourning everything that it ever was. So some of these things that are mentioned, ivory utensils, uh, pearls, precious stones, cambric, purple, silk. I'm not saying these aren't current commodities because they are, but they're also ancient commodities. So they're mourning the whole thing. We make a mistake to think that God is only dealing with the city that is existent at that time. But remember, this is important. This is very important. Babylon to God represents the city that he is going to destroy that represents everything hedonistic and avaricious that went before it. 
So since it is a representative city in that way, those mourning it are mourning it representationally. They're mourning it not only for what it most recently was, but for what it was in the past, what it meant in the past, the seat of power and of the pride of life. As John says, 1 John 2.16 speaks of the pride of life. That's the thing that makes you go around feeling smug, feeling good. I mean, it's not, not, nothing wrong with feeling good, but we feel good because God gives us goodnesses. But the people who don't have God in their lives, it's the pride of life. It's like, I'm the captain of my own ship. I'm the captain of my own salvation. And you get this smugness. You get this arrogance. That's one of the things God hates. I forget where that passage is. I'll, I'll put it down here. He hates a lying tongue and he hates haughty eyes, haughty eyes. That's the pride of life. And this is what Babylon, everything, every single instance of the pride of life, of arrogant people who think that they're just all that and they can survive without God. Thank you very much. It's all going to come on that city from the time since the disruption of the world. So you can see these merchants spoken of in Revelation 18, I'm going to say it again, they're not just mourning that particular city and an underground place could be, is called a city. It's still a city. We assume city has to be above ground. It doesn't. A city can be underground. Look it up. They're not just mourning the one that they see, the one that smoke that they behold. They're mourning Babylon as, a, as an emblem of the pride of life. I'm going to get more into that Monday. Hosea 11.1. 1. I'm going to have to end after this. I'm sorry about that, Hosea 11.1. 1. This is really remarkable. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. This is Hosea 11.1. 1. Long time before Christ came on the scene, out of Egypt I called my son? The prophet Hosea is talking about Israel in Egypt. Out of Egypt, I called my son, meaning my people Israel, and I called them out of Egypt. And we know that for a fact. If you've ever watched the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston and Yule Brenner, Brenner, yeah. And yet in Matthew 2, 13 through 15, this verse is quoted from Hosea to apply to Christ. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. And remain there till I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, quote, out of Egypt have I called my son, period, unquote. Do you think Hosea had no idea about that? And anyone who would have extrapolated that in that day and say, well, this is going to apply to the Messiah someday would have been called crazy you see how in a, a unique way prophecy is fulfilled isaiah 28 16 therefore thus saith the lord god behold i lay in zion for a foundation a stone a tried stone a precious cornerstone a sure foundation he that believeth shall not make haste the stone of course the citadel where david lived called zion there was a cornerstone. When they built the building, the masons know what they're doing. You have to lay the cornerstone, then you lay the foundation, then you build on top of it. But Peter interprets this in Isaiah, in uh, 1 Peter 2.8. He interprets the stone as Christ. And he actually quotes Isaiah 28.16 to do it, along with Psalm 118.22. These guys took literary license. And Isaiah 8.14. What a cocktail, which mentions a stone of stumbling and a cornerstone. And Peter applies it to Christ. Not going to read those passages. Go there yourself. He applies that to Christ. Taking literary license there, son. That's okay. It's legit. These guys are inspired by the Holy Spirit. One more, Zechariah 12.10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look unto me because they have thrust him through thrust him through and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn thrust him through kind of a vague reference thrust who through why thrust why through and who and yet jesus christ on the cross was thrust through by a roman spear and the scripture was doubly fulfilled many scriptures have a double fulfillment 
there's a partial fulfillment in the day, and then there's really the, the huge fulfillment, the big fulfillment, the real payoff later. And this is exactly what's happening in Matthew 24 when Jesus is prophesying concerning the destruction of Jerusalem. Let those flee to the mountains. And he's talking about when Titus comes in, in, in 70 AD. But you have to read Matthew 24 carefully because it goes from a prophecy concerning um, Israel at the time that in a few short years will be taken in will be you know just destroyed by the armies of titus but you have to look at it real close because he's also talking about a jerusalem in the future a jerusalem that will be persecuted by all the nations and at that time they will also have to flee to to the mountains you see the preterists don't realize this double fulfillment of scripture of scripture because they see matthew 24 and they say okay well the armies armies of titus that was the last thing that that was it there's no more fulfillment of it there isn't oh yes there is yes there is and like that, just like that, Babylon was a real ancient city that actually existed, and, and, and Babylon is also going to have a future fulfillment. And God's going to do it in a way that you least expect. <laughs>